Hi everyone, it's Shannon from the Story Center. I'm the program manager, maybe some of you know me. We're really excited to have you here today for the Story Center speaker series with Matthew Quirk. We are celebrating the release of his novel, The Hour of the Assassin, which you can buy signed copies from Rainy Day Books. And also to here tonight with us is Lisa Palmer, the MCPO Reader Services Coordinator. She'll be interviewing Matthew. So welcome, I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Hi, it's really lovely to meet you. Yeah, you as well. This is great. So um, when I have the opportunity to interview and chat with an author, I always like to do a little bit of research, find out a little bit about them, what I see online. And uh, I found out you are, a, I already knew this though, you are a New York Times bestselling author, but I did not know that you studied history and literature at Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, that you had you've done five years with the Atlantic reporting on crime, private military contractors, terrorism, prosecution, international gang. Um, so with that as a background, how, how did you transition? How did you move into writing fiction? Well, uh, it's sort of funny because it goes from, you know, the college studying literature stuff to the journalism stuff because, uh, you know, it was in college that I discovered I just love writing. I would do anything to write all the time. And um, I was writing these short stories, you know, in the, a very literary vein, because that's sort of what they teach in the academic setting. And I was just, I was terrible at them. Um, but I, I just loved writing so much. And I also was doing journalism in school. And um, through a series of sort of fortunate uh, coincidences almost, I ended up at the Atlantic. And um, it was such a great time to be, you know, really young in DC, suddenly kind of dropped in over my head in politics and foreign affairs. It was the run up to the Iraq war. You'd meet like, um, like foreign agents were around, you know, you'd meet like um, Ahmed Chalabi's guys with your friends who were uh, foreign affairs reporters. And then um, I was fortunate at the Atlantic that the uh, the owner of the magazine would bring me to his house and um, for dinners and he would have people over and you'd be sitting at a dinner and it would be like a former CIA director and a New York Times columnist mm -hmm. debating about, uh, you know, whether the US should become an empire again. It was just really heady stuff. Um, and there was so much intrigue and I was writing sort of squibs for the front of the magazine that um, I was only about like 22 when I got down there um that i just started getting back into fiction and there was so much material around me all the time so much great intrigue in dc that i um sort of connected that love of writing with you know having this great material and it all came together and um i've sort of been writing in that vein ever since so it just it worked out really well i'd kind of grown up on thrillers and uh some of the material i ran into in dc sort of brought me back to that so you um have you always wanted to write thrillers then well i started out not really knowing what to write i really just had the habit you know and i love okay, doing yeah. it and um so i would write everything i mean college is really funny because you know i was like 19 or 20 nothing really interesting had ever happened to me i didn't have any like interesting life experiences i mean i'm exaggerating but then you would write a lot of, you know, we'd read the New Yorker for class and you would, you know, it was all like this really beautifully observed domestic drama. And I just, I was terrible at it. Um, so in writing, I mean, I, it took me six or seven years to write my first novel. It started um, not really as a thriller. It started more as like a social satire kind of thing. I've been reading a lot of like Evelyn Waugh or um, if you think about like Christopher Buckley. Right. And um, and then I needed a plot, so I put sort of a you know a thriller plot in there. And then I was having the most fun with that. And then uh, I also was getting the best response to it. And it was really funny, you know, because people say write what you know. And um, I'm you know in day to day life, just sort of a you know kind of a funny guy. I'm not like the most intense hardcore guy, um, but. 
it, it turned out in writing these, I was really drawn to kind of the thriller stuff. Mm -hmm. And it just goes to show, you know, you need to write and um, just spend forever writing. Don't really worry about um, how good it is. And then you'll just sort of find your way into what clicks for you. And that's how it was with me and thrillers, you know, it was a mix of having that material in DC and then sort of trusting myself to write in that vein, which um, sort of surprised me that um, it turned out to be one of my strengths. I, I, um, I'm a big thriller person, so I absolutely get what you're saying. Uh, Hour of the Assassin is your newest release. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about that book. Well, um, tell me a little bit, you know, tease me with a, a little bit of a synopsis about it. Oh, OK. Well, I'll give you the hook, you know, <laughs> um, the the idea, which is based on some real life people. I like to do that in books. You know, you'll find some fascinating DC character and I'll tell people about them. And if they're like, really, if that's a real person, you know, fascinating. I'll say, oh, great. I have a good hook for a book and a main character. So the main character in this is a former Secret Service agent, and uh, he spent years protecting people from, you know, assassins and killers. And through that, he was sort of able to think like them. Mm -hmm. And then he uh, left Secret Service and began work as a red teamer, which is a real thing, um, where basically you pose as a threat. So he kind of pretends to be an assassin to test the security around high-ranking government officials or secure facilities and, um, you know, slips. And now he's sort of playing the villains he used to defend against. And to kick things off, he's on uh, a job. He's doing sort of a mock assassination of a um, former CIA director. And he gets there and... I mean, there are twists and turns, but, um, and this is the first like 10 pages and it's on the flap. Yeah. So um, not to spoil anything, but um, someone else has gotten there and he finds the former CIA director dead. But of course it looks like he's responsible and then he's on the run. So um, that's kind of the teaser for the book and was my you know, initial concept for the book. And then gotcha. it's just a question of spooling that out into a novel. So you mentioned that uh, your characters uh, are based on real people. Yes. Uh, do, do they know or you just take parts of real people? Well, uh, The Night Agent, my last book, was based on a friend of mine. And that was very much like, hey, I'm writing a novel about you. Um, sorry. Or <laughs> congratulations, you know, depending on how it's received. <laughs> you like it. Um, and then this one was sort of bits and pieces from real people through writing um, some of the other books I had gotten to know people who do this red team work. And it, it was a really fun find when I was researching these novels because, you know, when you sit down day to day to write a thriller, you're like, okay, my bad guy is going to kill a senator. And you say, well, how the heck do you kill a senator? And then you say, well, who would I call? Like an assassin? Um, and, you know, I'm used to reporting, so I would call people who are knowledgeable. And as I dug into this, I found out that there are these red teamers um, who are security experts who, you know, test security, and they actually know how somebody would try to kill a senator. And in extreme cases, you know, they might actually um, make a, a test run of it. Um, so it was such a cool find for me in writing these books because you could call them and say, like, you know, what what sort of technology do you use? What do you look for? And they would say, you know, um, the first example I ran across was, I think, breaking in the Department of Defense, and they used replica police badges. So I just was like, oh, my God, that's so cool, and uh, put that in a book. Um, so, you know, for this one, it was based more on bits and pieces of different red team work like there are red teamers who actually do plant explosives um in government facilities as audits and basically are like assassinating the uh, cabinet head or whomever and then i have other people who do um 
kind of different kind of job. So it was a lot of bits and pieces from all of them. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of thrillers, especially when we talk about political, because of um, the real life background you get and that knowledge and that understanding. How, what is your research like? What is your research methods? Well, I mean, I like to do these DC thrillers because I was just in that world for a long time. So, um, you know, I called people, I called a friend who was a senator for some of the Senate scenes. And, you know, you get to use things that you've just like picked up over the years. Right. Um, like senators have these cool hidden offices called hideaways. And sometimes nobody even knows where they are. And they're scattered all over the Senate. And I mean, the best ones are like these like secret luxury suites. Mm -hmm. So that's a detail I've known about forever from DC. So I just was like, oh great, I get to use that in this book. Um, and you know, there's other details. I, I like to get real issues in there. Um, right. So, you know, money and politics and dark money uh, was a big, for me um that i sort of wanted to delve into in this book you know often in these thrillers there's like a puppet master behind and i said well can i can i show people a bit more of like what the real life puppet master is um in a realistic way to sort of draw attention to that um so that really drew on a lot of you know prior knowledge from reporting about money and politics and there are other elements about sort of how um, the Washington elite keep their secrets hidden. And that was a mix of kind of just being around DC and seeing what happens when people are sort of doing their extracurriculars. And, um, and a lot of what had been in the news recently where you saw really the, the fine detail of um, how men in power get away with things for decades. So that was another element I wanted to bring into the book. Okay, I am. Um, oh, plenty of inside information there. <laughs> I like it. Now, um, we were talking before we went live about um, you put in handcuffs some uh, booksellers. This, this has become, this is fiction. Um, okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, my first books were sort of more crime, a little bit of caper. And so I had to, um, like I was saying with the research before, find out how people do heists and stuff and break out of handcuffs. Mm -hmm. and they have these red team guys. And um, I learned to pick locks and uh, got to know them a little bit. And, you know, one of them said, y you know what's can't miss if you're going to be writing these thrillers where people are getting chased around and um, escaping and everyone's trying to kill them he said you should do an urban escape and evasion course which is basically taught by some of these red team fellows mm -hmm. uh, and i went up to la and the the course is like three days of it's almost like thriller school picking locks and how to do counter surveillance and um break out of handcuffs and all this kind of thing mm -hmm. and uh and then the last day they they kidnap you, they throw you in the back of a van, they stone gun you a little bit and uh, put a hood on you. And then you have to get out of um, of handcuffs we, we, we were in and then you have to escape. And then they chase you across LA and you have to do counter surveillance and like find a way to get clothes and change clothes and avoid these guys. And they're like ex-Marines who are chasing you around. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a really fun- Oh gosh course it was i mean it was it was exhilarating um and if they catch you they handcuff you to like a fence or whatever or a parking meter and then you have to kind of beg people for a hairpin um so <laughs> you know, anyway, so no one caught me and and um it all went well but um this is sort of a long way back around to the handcuffs on tour with uh, you know Roger and Vivian and a lot of the other from Rainy Day and some of these other um, bookstores, I would bring the handcuffs and do a demo. Um, so that's just sort of one of the um, things that you get from research that I do during readings to uh, yeah spice it up a little. So literally, you can get out of handcuffs. Yes, yes, um, and it's it's not that hard. They all have the same key. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. 
And one of the more humorous things I picked up during this uh, course was any any decent hotel, <laughs> the concierge at the front desk will have a handcuff key. Oh God, that's too so funny. Comes up. <laughs> Just in case, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's too yeah. funny. Yeah. Uh, but what, that course sounds phenomenal. <laughs> I bet it gave you so much insight to help you with writing books too, um, having that that experience of those characters too, that you could put them in those types of situations. Yeah, and just being like terrified for six or eight hours, you know? And, and like, you know, we had to make weapons out of stuff we found in the street. It was, it was crazy, but it was, it was great. And that, um, I was writing a book about somebody being chased through Southern California at the time. So it was just perfect. Oh, oh gosh. I have so many questions I want to ask, but I do not want to take up all your time and hug you. So Shannon, we have some fantastic people watching. Do we have some questions? Oh, here we do. I'd like to know what a typical writing day looks like. Okay. So, um, I mean, to step back a little bit, like a writing year, mm -hmm. I outline for a month or two so I know on any given day what's next. Right. And um, I will usually wake up. I'm not one of these like 6 a.m. in chair people. Um, <laughs> I used to be a real night owl, um, and I'm a little better now. But, uh, you know, have breakfast, right. take a run, um, and usually during the run I'm like, picturing what's going to happen. I'll know, you know, the guy is going to meet the other guy and then they get ambushed, something like that. But you don't know what it looks like. You don't know where it is. You don't know sort of the cool little surprise moments. So I'll just take a run or walk and let that fill in in my mind and then come back and write that down for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll go do it again um picture the rest of it or the next scene and uh yeah i usually shoot for a thousand words a day um and usually if you hit that you can go a little farther um and yeah that's a typical writing day you know um if i get two or three of those in um that usually kind of fills up the day and uh that'll keep you on pace pretty well for a book a year yeah, I bet. Um, hopefully I'm not stealing somebody's question, but here I go. Uh, <laughs> in regards to your writing day, are you do you plot the entire book and then look at each scene each day as you've talked about? Or, or do you just have that story in your head and you take it more fluid, more organic each day? Where's my characters going? Uh, I, I have pretty much the whole story. Um, or at least like the main beats of the story figured out because mm -hmm. I find it's really hard to paint yourself in. It's really easy to paint yourself into a corner. Yeah. And um, when you're like at this level trying to figure out the texture of a scene, I can't be at this level trying to make sure that the whole book works. That's just me. I mean, there's great people who write by the seat of their pants and, um, yes. and, you know, they do a phenomenal job, but I outline, so I know sort of the, the big moves in the story, and then I sit down to write. Um, and then I can spend my time um, not like stressing that I'm getting myself into an impossible position, right. but uh, coming up with like the cool, you know, the micro stuff in the scene. Uh, oh, we have another one. Do you keep a running list of writing project ideas? And if so, how many pro um, projects sorry, do you work on at one time? I do. I use, um, I should mention, you know, for, for outlining and writing the story, I use um, a program called Scrivener, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And you can just like, move stuff around and try your book and change things around and then not, but not have to like, rewrite it in word, so I love that. And um, for story ideas, I use Evernote, um, but basically I just have these really long lists and I'll be, um, you know, sitting around and I'll read a an article, I'm trying to think of anything I've read recently, um, you know, an article about a heist and I'll say, oh, what if the CIA did that heist? And then I'll just make a note 
and say, that's a book idea and I'll tag it book idea. And then when it's time to um, write the next book, I look through and often I'm coming back to like the same five ideas that are always my, my best ofs. And I'll see what jumps out at me and I will um, run them past people. And, uh, you know, if you get somebody, if you get somebody, go, Ooh, you know, um, that's a great, that's a great moment. So like the hook for Hour of the Assassin is one of those where you're like, and then he finds the guy is already dead. And so I really try to kick the tires on the idea. Um, and that's, that's kind of a holdover from journalism because I would pitch all these ideas and the editors were so good that they could just tell, you know, of a hundred ideas, um, mm -hmm. which ones wouldn't work. And then, yeah, they, in terms of more than one project at a time, um, they do overlap where you're often, um, you're often doing marketing and promotion <laughs> right before a book comes out at the same time you're at the end of your deadline for the next book, which can be a little crazy. Um, and, you know, you're often cleaning up and revising a book um, while you're outlining the next one, which can be really nice because they're sort of different um, writing muscles. Yeah. Now, Shannon, you, you did have a question. You took it off. Could you put it back on for us? We have another one for you. Here we go. What was the most interesting thing you came across while researching? Oh, interesting. Huh. For this book. I'm trying to think. The Hideaways. The Senate. Oh, I'm a little stumped on that. Um, Is it? Across the many books you've written, is there something that that stood out for you that way? Across many yeah. Um, well, for this one, the research, you know, it was it was really digging into these these red team guys, and um, that was kind of the most surprising world I was in. Um, and the initial thing that made me really kind of lean forward and, and pay attention to these um, people who do red team work was that one study where um, I mentioned earlier, they actually go plant explosives inside of the executive suites of different, I think, cabinet heads and government facilities. And it was just so funny for me because the GAO, it used to be called the Government Auditing Office, um, if I'm remembering correctly, and then they changed it to the Government Accountability Office. But, you know, its reputation into, inside DC is like the biggest dorks you've ever seen. They're just auditing everything and like, you know, green eye shades. And then I was reading this study and they were, you know, sneaking live explosives into like the executive suite of the Secretary of Defense. And I was like, whoa, you know, you expect that from the CIA and stuff, but um, just the, the quiet old GAO. Um, and that, that sort of thing got me started on this whole um, mock assassination kick. Oh, we have another one. This is fantastic. Are there authors that inspire you or that give you ideas, motivation? Are there authors that you recommend? Oh, sure. Um, I always go back to John Le Carre. Um, it's nice to read somebody who does it so well that you can say, oh, whew, I don't have to, I don't even have to try to be that great. Um, so for pure literature and atmosphere and real kind of CIA spycraft uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, Western intelligence spycraft, he's great. Um, for... Uh, getting great classified stuff. Um, there's an author named Sean Naylor, S-E-A-N-N-A-Y-L-O-R. And he's just this um, reporter who, he worked for a wire service and sometimes the New York Times, but he will periodically publish a book that is just like everything the Special Operations Command has tried to keep secret for the last 15 years. And he just knows it all and lays it out. So he writes incredible books. Um, and in the genre, um, I love Joe Finder, uh, Mark Graney and Greg Hurwitz are writing uh, 
um, great series right now. I love Robert uh, Crace. Um, and I'm trying to think, I'm probably leaving people out, but um, those are the folks who I'm just, you know, waiting for their next book to come out to, um, to, you know, get it in front of me and, and uh, dive in. Shannon, do we have another question, please? How do you keep in touch with DC politics and intrigue when you live way out in San Diego? Well, I, I go back all the time and um, yeah, I have a lot of friends there. And my wife actually just finished a uh, graduate program, um, which was really cool. And she was back every other weekend. And it was really neat because it was kind of a mid-level or um, like an executive program. So everybody in there was doing really cool government work and a lot of like secret squirrel stuff. Um, so it's just going back a lot of, a lot of the time and, um, kind of my generation of, um, of people in journalism, mm -hmm. they were the first bloggers and sort of always on social media time. So, um, it's, it's kind of shocking how much of the conversation is online. And you know, like mm -hmm. how much you feel like you're kind of tapped into it day to day. Um, and then I, you know, I just do a lot of research. So, um, you know, from my time there and going back and forth, I've gotten to know um, through really kind of happenstance some CIA and FBI people. Um, so I get to run the stories past them and, you know, check in with them about the plot and how a person might react in a given circumstance. Right. Okay, well, these are just some juicy questions. Let's keep going. Um, Shannon, share with us another question. Oh, not sure she. Hmm? Shannon? I don't see one, but I. Oh. Oh, here we go. How much do you revise? I was about to steal one from her list. I didn't want to jump all over Shannon. But. Um, <laughs> Shannon, how, Shannon says, how much do you revise? I revise a ton. Mm -hmm. And um, I revise that much because it sort of takes the pressure off when you're first writing. And that's one of the bits of writing advice whenever I am giving a talk or something. I, you know, just just get the words down and don't worry about being perfect. And, you know, if you can't figure something out, just like, uh, just you can skip it or do something you know isn't perfect and keep going. Um, in journalism, there's a thing called TK, which means to come. Um, so if you're writing along, you're like, and the guy came in with a gun TK. Um, and that way you know, um, you've sort of left it a blank. I mean, you could use brackets too. Mm -hmm. um, so I will do what's, you know, referred to, um, well, people, go, a very rough first draft in, in writing circles, sometimes it has a slightly more um, profane name, but I will do a super duper rough draft um, just to get the story down and um, to have it all there. And then once that's there, it's it's a matter of revising and you can sort of relax and really work on turning it into the best possible version. Shannon, do we have some more questions? Uh, let's see. Oh, that was the last question there. So I'm just gonna jump in with my, my Snoopy nosing uh, of wanting to know. So this is a standalone. You have two series running series. Um, when will you be jumping back into your series and which one is first? Oh, well, so those were both um, kind of, I just did two books right. with one character and then two books with another character. Um, Are you planning to go and revisit those characters? There's no current plan. I'm sort of riding this standalone thing for a little while now. And, um, you know, so far it seems to be, it's really driven by these kind of fascinating Washington characters um, who are inspired by real life stuff, like the night agent in the last book or, um, you know, the red team folks in this one. Uh, so, 
yeah, there's no current plan to go back to those books, but I, I love them. Um, oh, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, you know, life is long. I may do another series. I may go back to them. No, okay, good to know. Well, I always like to finish off my author chats with asking one final question as a wrap up. But before I do, I just want to give thanks to you for coming to join us virtually. Um, it's very nice. Technology allows us to carry on events, even though we can't have them in person uh, right now. Um, this Story Center event is in partnership with Rainy Day Books. Please reach out to Rainy Day. Um, Matthew Quirk's books are there for you to purchase and they have signed copies also. So my last question to you uh, before we sign off is what advice would you give? What one piece of advice would you give to an inspiring writer? Since the Story Center is all about supporting writers and inspiring authors, you as an established writer, what would you share? What's your one tip? Well, this is my favorite piece of advice. Um, and I touched on it a little bit earlier, which is just get away from your computer. You mm -hmm. know, when you're, when you're figuring out the story, um, it's, it's really shocking. <laughs> um, it's crazy how much sort of deep thought needs to go into these, for me at least, to figure out the story and then figure out all the sub elements of the story and then figure out the character. And, um, you know, if I just try to take it all down in notes, I end up with a million notes and it's a total mess. So I will, when I'm figuring out the story, just take long walks and bother my family and run it past them and brainstorm. Um, and it's really a lovely way to do your work because you're, you're chatting with people. Um, you'll say something out loud that you thought was genius. And as soon as it comes out of your mouth, you're like, oh, no, sorry. That was the worst thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Um, and, and you're not, you know, stuck at, at the keyboard like all day. Um, and the same thing when I'm writing a scene, I'll sort of know, um, the rough parameters of that scene mm -hmm. and then I'll just walk, take a walk or just kind of like sit on a bench and stare at the space until the whole thing fills in in my head. Um, and I can see it and, um, then I go sit down at the computer to write it down. And that way you get away from a lot of things that really slowed me down when I was starting writing, which is kind of perfectionism and endlessly tinkering with the same scene. So, um, you know, in my case, it's just sitting down, getting the whole thing down and then sort of moving on to the next thing and, um, you know, knowing you can revise. That, that is good advice. Oh, um, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Everybody who has been listening and watching, we are so grateful you're here. Let me just remind you, check out Matthew's books at Rainy Day. And also, we would love your um, input. We have eval forms, uh, virtual edition. So there is a link within the comments for you to click on and give us an eval, uh, eval, sorry, eval, eval of tonight's program thank you so much for joining us and matthew you've been awesome thank you so much oh, this is so great thank you so much and thanks everyone for uh for tuning in we're still live so does shannon take us off